Okay, so um, in recent times, we've had the international community and international media, you know, trying to be a bit charitable to the African discourse. In a way, trying to shift the African narrative from a continent or that continent to a continent on the rise. Largely situated in the recent, you know, spikes in economic growth on the continent. You know, the World Bank, the IMF, and other institutions have indicated that the past five years, African countries have recorded some robust economic growth measured in terms of GDP. But while similar economic growth in other continents, both present and in past, had actually led to economic development and social development, but in a way, trying to shift the people from centers of worship to centers of production, because you know, new centers of production emerged, new industries emerged, which required that the people invest more of their time and energies in these centers. The situation of Africa is a bit different. Instead of this economic growth translating into the emergence of new centers of production, what we are rather seeing is that it is shifting the people away from the centers of production to the centers of worship. Invariably is to say that the situation of Africa, while the economy is growing, the African is becoming more religious. Why is it that rather than economic growth spearheading the emergence of new centers of production, it's rather leading to astronomical growth in centers of worship? I find this puzzling perplexing, and some major scholars around the world also find this perplexing too. They try finding answers, as you know, theories, hypotheses, theses were developed towards this end. But among the garment of theses that emerge is a cliche. And the cliche is simple, that you know, we are seeing this situation because the African is inherently religious. And so these centers of worship that are emerging is just to take care of a market that is already in existence. But I found this too narrow and simplistic. Because why is it that in the past, new centers of worship did not emerge the same way as it says today? And why is it that the situation today, which is managed by spikes in economic growth, is rather leading to more centers of worship? So, so like a fisherman, I put my hook, walk to the sea, trying to, you know, some fishing expedition to find answers. So I grabbed one of my favorite books, the thesis on the city of God, written by St. Augustine's. And in this thesis, we are made to understand by St. Augustine's that there are two entities, the city of God and the city of man, each operating according to its own logic. So while the city of God operates as on the logic of salvation, the city of man operates on the logic of the eminent. So you have pleasure, you have wealth, and so on. But St. Augustine's tried to make an understand that, look, these two cities, you know, operate independently of each other, such that, you know, like what we have in Matthew chapter 22, verse 21, that you render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to, you render to God the things that are God's. So you can call it a rebuttal of a sort. Even Tamir's thesis comes in and says, wait a minute. There's actually a relationship between these two cities. And the relationship is such that the transcendental goals, which is the salvation and so on, is rather contingent on the eminent goals. So whatever we do in this world is to prepare us towards a better place or a worse place in heaven. So putting these two theses together, I come to the understanding that the individual is bounded by two covenants. Call it, state, call it social contract, as we call it in political discourse. The first is the social contract we have the, with our imminent authorities. The contract we have with our government, we have our, with our state authorities, and so on. And the second is the contract we have with the transcendental, the one we have with our God, with Allah, with Dio, with our gods and goddesses, and so on. But in these two contracts, we are asked to submit our unflinging loyalties to these two authorities in return for some benefit. 
So while the eminent promise us maximum eminent returns, such as good jobs, good education, good health care, in general, you know, the good life, the transcendental, which is our God, promises us two things. The first is minimum earthly returns. So you have air you breathe, you have water from natural sources, you have subsistence food. In all this conjecture is to prepare us towards a salvational goal, a transcendental, a maximum salvational goal, which is to go to heaven. And while this trans uh, transcendental goal is also conjectured physically, but spiritual in actualization. So what you hear is that when you go to heaven, you know, eternal life, there is no sin, there is no punishment, beauty beyond measure, so therefore you don't need makeups, you don't need plastic surgeries, and so on and so forth. So what this implies is that the shift of the ordinary African between the centers of worship and the centers of production is accentuated by the performances, the competencies, if you like, of these two authorities. So invariably, the African is shifting towards the center of worship because of the failure of the eminent authorities, which is the African authorities, to fulfill the maximum promise that they made to the people. So the continent has become too notorious, inhabitable to its population, such that you have many of the youth you know, embark on the dangerous journey across the Mediterranean for greener pastures in areas whose realities they are yet to be accustomed to. The, the continent is so notorious to the people, you have diseases, you have conflict, and so on and so forth. So invariably, we can say that the generality of the people, majority of the people, are left with minimum earthly returns. So you find them drawing water from natural sources. They get their food from subsistence agriculture, which is largely nature-fed. They build their houses from nature. And so everything revolving their life is but nature-driven. To make this issue much worse, to stimulate this state of thinking further, you know, is the activities of the African you know, state authorities themselves, knowing their own failures, instead of approaching the people through the centers of the eminent that they promised them, the good schools, the hospitals, they rather approach these people through the centers of salvation. All of a sudden, politicians on the continent have become preachers of the gospel of prosperity. They mount the podium and tell the people, today, I am who I am. I'm enjoying maximum earthly returns because the Almighty tried to, you know, shower his bountifulness on me. Some of them even engage in building these centers of worship, increasing the number of centers of worship. They build cathedrals, they build churches, they build mocks, they build shrines. And perplexingly, they build this sometimes in centers that require mini, uh, eminent benefits. So they build cathedrals in places that require hospitals, that need schools, that need good roads, in areas that the youth are largely unemployed, and so on and so forth. So invariably, what this implies to the ordinary African is that the, the transcendental, our God, is just not competent enough in the fulfillment of the minimum earthly returns it promises us. But it is more competent in even taking the roles of the eminent authorities, in providing us the maximum benefits, earthly benefit that our authorities promise us. Our God is competent enough, not just in giving us the natural waters that we want to withdraw, but he's competent enough even giving us a good life, giving us the mansions that we want, giving us the how, uh, giving us the roads, uh, the, giving us, you know, the, the Ferraris that we want, giving us the good jobs that we want. So invariably, a little eavesdrop on the, you know, the prayers of the ordinary African in centers of salvation, the churches and the mocks and so on, reveals this clearly. Being in centers of worship, they don't pray for salvation. They pray for eminent returns. In centers of worship, they pray for the good life. They pray for good health. They pray for good job. They pray for good husbands. They pray for good wives. And even to extend, I met a little boy. His story was simple. His prayer was simple. 
God, this morning, as I walked myself out of home, I stole a fish from the pot. But as I walked my way home, please prevent my mom from realizing that a fish is missing from the pot. But if she dares realizes that the fish is missing, please prevent her from scolding me. This is the extent. So the shift of the people from the centers of production to the centers of worship is accentuated by the failures of the eminent authorities, by the failures of the African government to provide the people the basic lives that they, require, that they promised them, the maximum eminent returns that they promised them. So to, 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 to reverse this trend, the simple things that African authorities require to do is meet the eminent promise you made to the people. Meet the good life you make to the people. Instead of putting up cathedrals in places that require schools, put up the schools. Instead of putting up mocks in areas that require drinking water, put up the drinking water. Otherwise, we shall be gathered here once again. And our story will be simple. Just like in Robert Frost, two roads, not, a road not taken. The situation will simply be like two roads diverge in the yellow wood. And as one traveler be the African, he has to just pick one road. But he picks this road not because he knows the extent of that road, but because he picks it on the basis of hope. The hope that in ages and ages hence, he shall be telling his story with a sigh. That when two roads diverge in the wood, he picked the one less traveled by. And perhaps, perhaps it made a difference he envisaged. Thank you.